I always look forward to talking to my next guest, which we we have a talk about you know, once a month or so, uh, because he has insights uh, that benefit me greatly, and I hope you as well. Richard Wolf is Professor of Economics Emeritus at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. He's currently a visiting professor in the Graduate Program of International Affairs at the New School University in New York. He is a host of the program Economic Update, on Free Speech TV. You can see it uh, on Tuesday evenings from 8 to 9 Eastern Time. And he is the founder of Democracy at Work. Info. Uh, and he wrote, recently wrote an article I thought would be a great way to start our conversation. So, first of all, Richard Wolf, thanks for coming back on the program. Well, thank you very much for having me. Always a pleasure. And your article in truthout.org. Uh, uh, had the headline, uh, Grades are Capitalism in Action. Let's get them out of our schools. Briefly, what's your thesis? Well, you know, it comes out of my life as a student and then as a professor, which I've been pretty much all of my uh, adult life, including right now. I hated grades. I hated them when I got them as a student. And then when I became a professor, I learned to hate them just a little bit more. <laughs> And so I finally decided with some encouragement from friends to write down in that truth out article that you cited uh, why I felt this way. And the argument goes roughly like this. I absolutely think that one of the things uh, that distinguishes the relationship between a good teacher and a good student is the ability of the teacher to give the student feedback to explain to the student as best the teacher can where the student's learning and reasoning and thinking and research are really productive and interesting and going somewhere and when they aren't. So there's no criticism that, the, that teaching is a problem or bad, not at all. Uh, that's not the issue. The issue is what is the meaning of putting down a letter you know, A or B or C, that is a shortcut. And it's a shortcut that in my judgment, not only doesn't work, but is bad and counterproductive. And let me explain why. Every student has strong points and weak points, just like every teacher. And every student can be an original thinker if you give him or her a chance. Therefore, when a teacher teaches, they, a good teacher always knows that the student may attack the question or the problem or the topic in a different way from the way the teacher does. You can't just look at a paper or an exam question and say, oh, the student got it right. Why? Because they may just have copied something. They may have memorized something in order to understand whether the reasoning process of a student is something you want to praise and encourage or something you want to correct, here's the only way to do it. You need to take time, you need to sit with the student, you need to read what they write, you need to discuss it with them. If you think they're not getting it, give them a chance to show you that maybe they got it in a different way than you did, which is not a failure, but in fact a greater success than merely mimicking you, et cetera, et cetera. Professors in our society are not given the time, not given the space, not given the, given the limited number of students, not given the rewards of a salary, et cetera, to allow them to do the kind of evaluation that would really help a student. Instead, we are told, do something simple, give them a test, have them write a paper on something and then say you are a B plus or you are a C minus. That is not very helpful at all. It's a crude shortcut that shortchanges both the teacher as someone who could really develop his or her students and the students who could use the kind of evaluation we're talking about. And all I'm saying in the article is we ought to face that reality. What we are doing by giving those shorthand grades, those shortcut grades, instead of a real evaluation, 
is we're saying to a potential future employer, this is a student who takes instructions and does what you tell them and mimics what the professor says and repeats what the textbook writes and therefore will be a docile uh, tool, a docile employee, and if that's what you want, take the A student. But if you want a creative thinker, it, you, the grade will never tell you whether you've got that. If you want someone who can really make a contribution to your business because he or she thinks in a creative way, relying on grades will never tell you that one way or another because it's such a crude shorthand for what needs to be done. So think of it this way. It's an appeal. Either we give teachers and students the kind of education they need and that would benefit our society and that would cost us some money, or we don't. We, keep, we stay with the ABCD grade system, but then let's at least be honest enough to face the fact that this is something that designs useful markers for an employer who wants a docile employee. That's all it does, and that's why I call it a mechanism of capitalism. But if we want a creative society, if we want people that are gonna figure out how to solve our problems, then that grading system is of no use at all. You know, it's interesting to me, I, I, many things about this are interesting, but one of the aspects of this that intrigues me is that we were talking uh, earlier before uh, we went on the air about the fact that I found that a right-wing site was attacking you for having written this. You'd think of all people, the uh, libertarian right-wingers might want to embrace this sort of thinking. They may, because even if they're pro-capitalist, which they presumably are, uh, there's an element of deep regimentation in the grading system. It basically says to each student, and I'm thinking of at all ages, from first grade up through postgraduate, it's basically saying to students, we are not valuing you for you. We are not promoting your freedom intellectually to explore the avenues that intrigue you or, or to bring f forth your great gifts as a human being. All we are doing is controlling you and measuring your ability to be controlled and produced according to our standards. Now, I would think there would be an element of the right as well as uh, the left that would say, you know, maybe that's not such a good idea. You know, I think you're very perceptive and let me show you how very perceptive you are. Please. Shortly after the, after the <laughs> article appeared, shortly after that, I was called up by no one else but Fox News, the Fox Broadcasting System, inviting me onto one of their major programs to be uh, interviewed by a panel for people about this crazy idea of mine about grades. So I went there, uh, a chance for my perspective to be heard on Fox always strikes me as something worth doing. And, and, and I get along with those people at Fox perfectly well, and so I went. And exactly what you think happened, after they made some derogatory remarks about what a crazy idea to think that grades have something to do with capitalism, etc., I made the same explanation, basically, that I just gave you, and I would say it was like a 50-50 split. Two of the four people continued to make, you know, ridicule what I was saying, but the other two, you could see, hadn't thought about it in just the way you just articulated it, and they were, in fact, intrigued and didn't know quite how to respond because they found themselves kind of halfway siding with me, which they had not expected to do. You know what I, what I was also thinking about as you were speaking was early in my career for a while I was kind of a computer programmer and systems designer, mostly for health insurance companies, I'm embarrassed to admit. But um, as part of that, I remember, you know, we used to 
collect medical information from people and so on. And somebody would say, why don't we let people uh, type in this field here what it is they're feeling right now or what they're experiencing? And the answer was always, no, you can't do that. They have to choose from one of five options because if they just express themselves, then you can't analyze the data later and sort those people into categories to be treated differently. Uh, you'd have to read each and every one and, and we don't want to do that. And it seems to me that even though grading predates, uh, predates computer science by many years, Years, it seems to me that the same process is at work, but as you say, uh, on behalf of capitalism, something that basically says, okay, this person is good at taking written information and regurgitating it, so uh, we will find them useful in the slot over here. This person is poor at that, but maybe they have physical strength we can exploit in another way. It strikes me that it's basically, it's just data sorting. Exactly, and it produces no creative breakthrough whatsoever. Uh, you know, it's a little bit, for me, the metaphor I like is, there's kind of, think of it this way, two kinds of doctors. There's one kind of doctor who has learned to go through the medical school, learned, do a blood test, give you an x-ray, uh, check your pulse, go through a set of rules and draw the conclusion based on that set of rules. Then there's a second kind of doctor. Yeah, he goes through the rules, but then he sits down or she sits down and asks you other kinds of questions. Have you been under stress at your job? Uh, how is your relationship with your spouse and your children? Have there been emotional issues that have come up in your life? In other words, there's the doctor who says there's always information, potentially crucially valuable information in getting to know a patient as the unique human being each one is, and that can give insights into their medical issues that you can't get from a pulse or a blood test. And so it's not an either or. Again, I'm not against the grades if they were part of a process that involved a real, careful, time-consuming evaluation. My complaint about grades is that they are substitutes for that and they don't work well in that way. You know, it's fascinating that you use the medical analogy because the type of medicine you're describing is often called cognitive medicine, right? So we're talking about the process of a doctor sitting and taking time to get to know a patient, ask questions and what's going on. And what I was, one of the things I was thinking while you were talking, Richard Wolf, was that uh, our capitalist based healthcare economy does not value that type of medicine either. Those tend to be the lowest paid medical specialties, starting with primary care and family care. And, uh, you know, but if you go into the kind of field that says, well, I'm going to measure X, Y, and Z radiology, you'll get much uh, better compensated. If you go into the kind of field that says, I'm going to measure uh, X, Y, and Z flexibility in a joint, and if it doesn't conform to standards, I will replace it with an artificial joint, you'll get even better compensated and so on. So it seems to me that whether it's medicine or education, what we're really talking about here is a shift to the cognitive, that is to say the humanistic processes, the human-centered processes that can make for better learning and better health. Yeah, and here's where the capitalism comes in to, to make the point. Capitalism has a simple bottom line. It's called profit. It's what capitalists themselves teach to the students in business schools. You're in the business to make a profit. The bigger the profit, the higher the rate of profit, the greater the measure of your success. Don't spend a lot of time on details, on context. Your job is to maximize the profits. And they tend to fit, make everything they can think of manageable into simple basic categories so they can reduce the complexity of any enterprise into some manageable, manipulated, rule system. And the irony is, if you push them, they will agree that the creative breakthrough in, in, in uh, all business 
were the people who didn't play by those rules, who took a chance, who had an instinct, who had a hunch. But in their rush for profit to make it all regulatable and rule governed, they want to be able to give a, a, a subordinate an assignment. They want to hire someone who got an A because he takes instruction and does what they're told and follows the rules. And so they make the system to conform to the people and the people to conform to the system. And the result is a failure to take advantage of the spark of genius that everybody has. I can't tell you the number of times that I have sat, sat down with a student, often a student who didn't do well on an exam or didn't do well on a paper, only to discover that the student had read the question in a different way than I had designed it. But that difference wasn't wrong. It was a different way of seeing, and I became the student learning from the student, who was my teacher then, that there are other ways of posing these questions, other ways of seeing them that lead to different answers. That is a moment of wonderful education for both of us, which I would have lost if I had just read the exam, plugged it in, given the student to C minus that the exam answer suggested to me and never had the opportunity to do something that would have taught that student and me invaluable lessons that, that I say would otherwise have been lost. Again, we're talking with Professor Richard Wolf, economist and host of uh, Economic Update. You know, one of the thoughts that occurred to me uh, as you were speaking was you're describing, I used the word humanistic once already, but you're describing a very human-centered program, I think it was William Butler Yeats who said education is not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire. Um, so you're, you're describing this human center program. You're also doing it in an anti-capitalist context. And a lot of people conflate anti-capitalism, socialism, Marxism, uh, you know, everything, uh, the general field of, because I wouldn't say that liberalism is, is, is anti-capitalist. They associate all those things with a kind of top-down regimentation. That's what we've been trained to believe, and yet what you're describing is the opposite of a regimented, regimented system. You're saying that the, the demands and perhaps the culture of capitalism, uh, you're not saying this explicitly, but one, it encourages competition. I think you are kind of saying that explicitly. Two, it, um, it, it, it postulates winners and losers along with that. But three, you're saying that's where the regimentation comes in, that the regimentation doesn't come in from uh, a democratically run economy. The regimentation, which people uh, uh, associate, with, I think, a lot of people in this country with Big Brother or what have you, that the regimentation comes from thinking we can be fitted into slots like this so that we can be inputs for an eco economic system that doesn't serve us. Yeah, and you know, I'm reminded by your, your comment that if you, go, if you go into many offices of many governments and you speak with the people working there and you ask, how did you come to design the work process here, the way people are designed to work? And the answer they will often give you is, we try to be businesslike. People should understand, if you don't like the way the government works, Please notice that what the government is doing is trying to organize its processes just like a business. And the clue is, if you go to work in a real corporation, and if you're not an ideologue protecting them, you'll discover that inside every sizable corporation is rigid planning, top-down planning, telling everybody what to do, how to do it, where to do it, when to do it, and then to go home and go to sleep so they can come back tomorrow and follow the rules again. What is attributed to the government ought to be attributed to capitalist enterprise because that's where the model from, of how the government works comes from. That's what it's replicating. That's what it is trying uh, to be. But you're quite right. This, for me, this is what's wrong with capitalism. And let me, let me get at it quite another way. 
I went to school at elite universities in the United States. I went to Harvard, then I went to Stanford, then I went to Yale. When I got into those universities, and particularly as I moved up through them, the higher I went, the less A, B, and C was relevant. By the time I got to the graduate program, it was basically irrelevant. Some teachers didn't even bother. When we had our workshops towards the end of our education, when we were getting ready to write our doctoral dissertations, many of my fellow students and I had a great crisis because to write a dissertation, you are told you must be original. Mm. Well, that's very difficult because we had spent our entire lives before we got to that point being the opposite of original. In fact, copying, mimicking, doing what we knew was necessary to get that A that would get us to the graduate school and the PhD program. And the professors never understood why is it so difficult for the students to write a dissertation and be original. What they didn't want to face was they were presiding over an education system that had literally driven all originality out of the students as it forced them through this regimen of being a docile, passive repetitor of what they were being taught. And by the way, many graduate students don't write doctoral dissertations because they can't make the transition. The psychological difficulties are too great. It's not that they lack ability. It's not that they lack intelligence. They don't. Many of the best students never write a dissertation because they have had such a drubbing of their originality out of them that when it's finally asked of them, they are literally at loose ends, and that shows you the price of an education system that doesn't welcome and encourage originality, that doesn't understand that the student often has much to teach the teacher, et cetera, et cetera. And that is a, 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 a process of capitalism. That's how enterprises are run, but to run education like that is a terrible mistake. And the end product of everything you're describing, the people who excel the most at, within this regimented system and make it through to the point that they get a master's or if they get a PhD, they have to think originally if they get a master's, and I don't want to offend everybody with a master's out there, but, but in many cases, they don't need to do a PhD, so they don't face that particular challenge. But the people who make it through our country's elite institutions who are the apex of this, or the many brilliant people there, but apex of this, the same institutions you went through, Rich, Richard Wolf, uh, they not only run our businesses by and large, but they're expected to run our government and other areas of society too. I mean, it's an interesting sort of side, uh, maybe not even a digression from this conversation, but uh, one of the big splits on the left now, one of the big splits in the Democratic Party now that I think doesn't get talked about enough is that there is, uh, you know, the liberal wing of this elite group, there's a centrist wing, there's a right wing, but then there's a whole insurgent group of people who say, wait, a minute, that's not the, coming up through that system is not the only way to prove that you should be a, a leader in our government and in our society. And I think there's a kind of war going or struggle going on that doesn't get acknowledged and doesn't get discussed. But, but I would think that government and society would benefit greatly, not by rejecting everyone who comes to an elite institution, but by also looking elsewhere for people whose life experience might qualify them for senior government roles or heads of foundations or whatever else is out there. Yeah, I, I, I want to make sure one thing I said is, is not misunderstood. We were told when we were writing our dissertations that you were supposed to be original because that's what your, the, the rule kind of is. But the truth of it was, whenever a student became original, the professors usually came down on that student in a critical way. And the irony was we began to figure out why. Because they, like us, had come through a system that never rewarded originality. It rewarded doing what you're told, mimicking what the teacher said, repeating it in your own words, reinforcing the very same ideas that the teacher had. 
And so even though the teacher said, we want you to be original, if you actually were, they were critical. They wanted something about which they could say it was original without having to confront that the whole system and they themselves had been drubbed, had the originality pushed out of them. I've seen it over and over again because this problem of our education system settles deep into the psychology of our society and costs us the brilliant breakthroughs in science, in the arts, in politics that we could have if we encourage the people who see it differently to share with one another their differences rather than bury them in the name of a conformity. What you're describing, Richard Wolf, is a social tragedy, which, and you're outlining some of the ways in which it is a social tragedy, right? Because uh, you're talking about what we don't achieve, what individuals within society don't achieve for us. It's also a personal tragedy, I think, replicated many times over. We have people, you know, I've always felt, you know, there are philosophers who write about this, as you well know, but uh, that the uh, failure to for a human being to fulfill their potential and therefore their satisfaction um, is, a, is a human tragedy each and every time it happens. And what you're describing is a human tragedy repeated many times over as people who don't fit the mold but have a lot to do and say are herded or filtered out of the system uh, by this drive for conformity. Yeah, it's very sad. You drive the originality out of people, uh, the vast majority, the few who survive, usually by hook or crook or some uniqueness in their uh, environment, are then celebrated as the great geniuses, as if other people lack the capacity to make a breakthrough, rather than facing that you, you live in a system that precludes the majority of people of having the, the opportunity. Albert Einstein is famous for having explained that when he was a young student, he systematically flunked mathematics and flunked physics because he saw things differently. He came through the sieve, so we call him a genius. But what we're really not facing is that he lucked out and came through the system without having had the originality drummed out of him. If we didn't run our system the way we do, there'd be a lot more Einsteins and we would have a better chance of solving the problems that plague us than we now do. Can you imagine an educational system without grades, what that might look like? I mean, would you, I mean, you, you mentioned, you said earlier, well, it might have grades as part of a broader, you know, spectrum. Yes, I can, I, I can give you two examples that I know of how that works. One is the uh, dissertation writing, and even the much of the higher education in, in Oxford and, and uh, Cambridge in England. Basically, when you reach a certain level, equivalent to our, I don't know, junior or senior year in, in college, your education changes. You can go to lectures and hear a professor in a big room, but that's, that's incidental, that's extra. The core interaction is between you and a professor who is assigned to you. You probably write a paper every week or two or three, give it to the professor who reads it, and then meets with you for an hour to discuss how you set up the problem, how you approached it, how your reasoning worked. In other words, they have recognized over there in a system that is focused on the elites, that's who goes to Oxford and Cambridge, that if you want to develop really creative elite parts of your society, you precisely do not stick them in an ABC mass education program. Let me give you a second example. Since I was a professor for many years at the University of Massachusetts, uh, it was part of something called the five college system. There are five colleges in that area of Amherst, Northampton, Massachusetts. One of them does not use grades. It's called Hampshire College. It existed when I was there, it exists now. It does not give students grades. When you have a student in your class from Hampshire College, which I often did, 
you are required to write an essay towards the end of the semester assessing the students' strengths and weaknesses. And that goes into a portfolio that other teachers contribute to. So when that student moves up through the hierarchy, subsequent teachers and evaluators will have a set of essays kind of marking the development, the progress, the maturation of that student. It's awkward, it takes extra time, it takes extra effort, and I know of professors who don't want to give it, who don't feel paid for that extra time, which by the way, they're not, mm -hmm. and so they resent it, and so they write a, a perfunctory essay giving it really not much more time than in the past they would have given if they'd assigned the grade, thereby defeating the whole purpose. But there were professors who did take it seriously. And so you had an option to do something much more like what I'm talking about, much more respectful of the student's originality, much more honest in being open to the student seeing things differently from what you as the teacher intended. So there is an example. It's a very expensive college, Hampshire College, so it's not open to everybody. They have some scholarships and so on. I mean, I, I'm not doing an advertisement for them, but I'm saying they're not the only one in the United States, but there are places around the world that have understood what I'm saying and have tried, at least to some extent, to get away from this cookie cutter shortcut we call the grading system. It would be interesting to imagine our society and our economy, if all education shifted to a, to a system like that, I, I feel that the changes would be more profound than, uh, than just within the educational system, as important as that is. But I think we're probably running out of time. So uh, do you have any closing thoughts before we say farewell for now? Well, just on this point, um, I think a certain humility. If you look around the world today, we are faced with an economic crisis. I'm an economist, and I can tell you we certainly are. We have a fundamentally unstable economic system that every four to seven years plunges us into a downturn. Some of those, like the 1930s and the one in 2008, are very severe cut deeply into our society, last for many years. We're still coming out of it now, and the next one is already on the horizon. Alongside the economic crisis, we have a political crisis. We have an extraordinary leader uh, here in Mr. Trump who is violating most of the norms of our society, reopening racist and other kinds of divisions in our society, uh, whether you're for him or against him, you've got to be able to see that. Producing copies like Boris Johnson in England, who's literally tearing that society apart as they can't even have their parliament meet, and I could go on. Alongside of that, we have a crisis in, in, in our relationship with nature, climate change, global warming, you name it, with serious scientists around the world worrying about literally our survival. If ever society needed to welcome, to encourage the thinking of our people to come to terms with these crises, not to continue the way we have, because that's how we got to this situation, it's now. And we ought to be deeply questioning the most important institution that develops our young people to be adults, namely education, to see whether important alternative ways could be tried, could be institutionalized, so that we can begin to compare systematically alternative ways of getting this process done in the hopes that one of them will produce the kinds of thinking that can solve these problems before we all disappear. For me, therefore, these are not, you know, interesting, merely interesting conversations about grades. These are attempts to get at the core dilemmas of our society before it's too late. Well, I think that's extremely well said. I'm, I'm tempted to be flippant and say I'd give it an A, but um, I will say extremely well said and uh, very much appreciated. And as always, it's very much appreciated uh, that you joined us and shared your thoughts with us, Professor Richard Wolf. So thanks for coming on the program.
Glad to do it and look forward to our next conversation. As do I.